For the colorful wrap-up to Chapter 22, we'll talk about very cool diazonium ions. All right, where are we? We've seen EAS, we've learned EAS and the addition of halogen, alkyl, nitro, and sulfonyl electrophiles. We've seen how to manipulate substituents on aromatic rings by oxidation reduction. Now we're going to learn about a new and wild and crazy kind of functional group as yet unseen that gives us a lot more power. That being the aryl diazonium ion. Okay, diazonium ions. Well, to start with aryl diazonium ions, we have to go back to, of all things, general chemistry and think about what would happen if I threw together sodium nitrite in HCl, which means you need to remember what, or be able to come up with, a reasonable Lewis structure for NaNO2, which of course would be anionic, five electrons from nitrogen, 12 from oxygen, and then an extra because it's an anion, so 18, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. There's our sodium nitrite negatively charged. So naturally, the product of HCl plus sodium nitrite would be this guy. So what do I have? I have this neutral molecule. You know what's coming next, don't you? Am I done yet? Heck no! Just like what we've seen in the previous examples where we've activated our electrophile, we're gonna make a good leaving group. So, we get to this point where, as you can plainly see, we've made that great leaving group again, and we've got those neighboring lone pairs, so boom, that's the product of sodium nitrite and HCl. The and oh, no electrophile. Alright, so I've made yet another good electrophile that can react with... Hmm, what can it react with? Well, it can react with a primary amine. So, for example, if I take aniline which as you are well aware, primary amines are good nucleophiles. And I have this nice looking electrophile. Where is it going to attack? Remember that 99 times out of 100, that is not what happens. Oxygen already has 8 electrons. It just wants to get rid of that positive charge. So what happens is it attacks the atom next door. That gives me this intermediate and what's going to happen next? Deprotonation. I'm just going to use B where B could certainly be my nitrogen from aniline. And that'll take us to this guy. This is called an N-nitrosoamine. And there's some interesting informa information in your textbook about N-nitrosoamines that kind of make you think, you know, maybe I don't want to eat so much bacon. But I'll leave that up to you. What's nifty about this intermediate is that it's pretty easy to see how this 
can pop out and pick up another proton to give me that species. And when you get that far in your mechanism, you should be looking at that and saying, huh, another hydroxyl group. I'll bet I can make that into a good leaving group. And I'm not even going to show that electron movement. I'm going to cheat and just put that next proton on. And you know what's happening. You know what's coming next. That neighboring group is just going to pop out that water group. And there you have your final product, your diazonium ion. Now diazonium ions are pretty dang special because if that guy leaves with its pair of electrons, it's made N2 gas. There is no better leaving group than a gas. We've seen CO2 leave in a decarboxylation. Fantastic leaving group. So what is the product between sodium nitrite and HCl? The NO electrophile. And what is the product of that electrophile with a primary amine? A diazonium ion. And diazonium ions are so unstable that the only kind of diazonium ions that you're going to see in this class are aryl diazonium ions. They're stable below zero degrees. So what's so special about aryl diazonium ions? Well, they're electrophiles, as would make sense. Thinking about the same kind of electron movement we've seen all along, it's that terminal nitrogen that will be attacked by a nucleophile so that that pair of electrons can be picked, kicked back to nitrogen to give it back its neutrality. But aryl diazonium ions are electrophilic at the carbon bearing the diazonium functionality, which you should be thinking, whoa, Carpenter totally lied to us. Because now I can actually do substitution on an sp2 hybridized carbon. You've waited 15 weeks for this. I take an aryl diazonium ion, I throw in a nucleophile and copper plus one and I get a reaction. It's known as the Sandmeyer reaction. So here is, who knows, copper iodide, copper chloride. Note that I'm keeping this below 10 degrees. If I let this warm up above 10 degrees, my nitrogen leaving group is going to leave and then, you know, I've, I've decomposed my aryl diazonium ion. So as long as I keep this cold, I can actually carry out what looks to be, for all intents and purposes, substitution of N2 with X minus. That which I have told you over and over again, you can't do this. And it turns out that I didn't lie to you. This isn't what it looks like. It is not an SN2 reaction. It is a radical reaction. And just to remind you, every time we have seen this guy, it has been funky. Copper is telling you the mechanism is weird. It's not a normal nucleophile electrophile, as in, remember the cuprate? The cuprate that does not react 1, 2, but instead reacts 1, 4. The cuprate that will actually couple with a halide. Cuprates are weird. This is a radical reaction. But the bottom line is it works, and it works with absolutely total regio control. By that I mean if the N2 group is on that carbon, that is precisely and only where your incoming nucleophile ends up. The nice thing is, man, a nucleophile can be just about anything. So this is a fantastic way 
to put well, let's use the black here and you something nucleophilic on your aromatic ring you just have to come from the diazonium ion which means you have to come from the amine which means you have to come from the nitro group which is a lot of steps backwards but if that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. So let's look at a couple of, of examples. We've already gotten to the primary amine. So this is the guy that is going to be able to react with. Now it's not sodium nitrite and HCl. We're just using sodium nitrite and sulfuric acid. Doesn't really matter. We just need a proton source. So these guys react to give me this and the nitronium ion reacts many steps loss of water to give me my diazonium ion so this goes to this guy And now you see you are adding a nucleophile and you know from your previous studies that you can't do substitution on a typical old SN2 in a, in a typical SN2 fashion on a typical sp2 hybridized carbon with a typical halide leaving group but now because we have copper in there we've got some kind of funky radical reaction going on and the nucleophile that's present is going to in a mechanism that sure looks like SN2 I shouldn't even show these electron movement arrows all I should show is boom the product of that reaction that again this guy got converted to the um, diazonium ion which gets regio specifically replaced by my incoming nucleophile so now if I see an aromatic ring that I need to make hmm there's my target well let's focus on the phenol for right now because this is the stuff we're talking about that's a nucleophile it would seem that I would need to add something like this to based on what I've been telling you the only thing that's going to work is the diazonium ion and that is correct the conditions and reagents are actually copper oxide and water are the primary reagents you need to convert that diazonium ion into the phenol and then of course we can work backwards to the amine and work backwards to the nitro group and work We'll work our way right into chapter 23 because the next thing we're going to have to worry about is which do I put on the aromatic ring first the isopropyl group or the nitro group but that's next chapter all right so there is our synthesis of that guy and we'll finish up with a road map I look at this starting material I say to myself I don't recognize any of these reagents but at least I can see that that's a reducing agent so what could be reduced well that could be reduced and that could be reduced and maybe I will have a brilliant flash of insight and realize that oh yeah I need a zero valent metal like zinc to reduce my nitro group down to the amine and that amine I recognize that these two react together to make this guy and yeah 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 that goes that goes over here da, 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 da. 
that gives me in and oh oh yeah that goes like so yeah and and oh yeah 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 then I protonate protonate lose that oh yeah 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 I get all this all this that's all the that diazonium ion stuff okay so I'm making my diazonium ion okay so but what what's going on here so what's this I know the diazonium ion is gonna react with a nucleophile but HBF4 that looks like a proton to me let's see I have to go back to Lewis acids I mean not Lewis structures BF4 periodic table that means this is a negative charge oh yeah and then this okay but a hydrogen's not a nucleophile. What's nucleophilic about this? I certainly can't have boron be my nucleophile because it already has eight electrons. It's not going to have any more. BF4 gives you F minus, just like BH4 gives you H minus. Did I mention anything about patterns recently? So, what do we get here? We get substitution of the diazonium ion with fluoride. So that's how you put a fluorine on an aromatic ring. Then, oh, we've got the acid. Foo -foo -foo, doo -doo -doo. I believe this is thionyl chloride. So up, down, out. Kicks out the chloride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, this gives me the acid chloride. Because the intermediate, the Cl, comes back and kicks it out. That's right. Okay, so if I get the acid chloride here, well, that's very obviously an electrophile. So my electrophile here, my nucleophile there. Let's just up, down, out. That's ugly. That's an awful lot of carbonyls. What was this? This was the clason, eh? So we had a clason here. Now what? Well, this is going to hydrolyze my esters. And if I remember right, once I have a beta keto acid, ah, uh, yeah, I can just redraw this. Like so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's my acid, and I just go whomp, whomp, whomp. I lose CO2. This is that decarbo decarboxylation step. So I've decarboxylated. Now what's going on? Ay, ay, ay. What the heck is going on here? Well, nucleophile for sure. Yeah, nucleophile there, nucleophile there, nucleophiles everywhere. We know phosphorus tribromide is our electrophile. Delta positive because we got three fantastic leaving groups pulling electron destiny away from the phosphorus. If I remember right, think about this. I think this converts this to the acid bromide, which can then react at the active methylene to give me, oh, this is that cute hell volhard zelensky reaction. And it's the second step, that work up here hydrolyzes the acid bromide back to the acid. And what did this allow me to do? It allowed me to carry out a legitimate SN2 displacing that bromide and putting the azide on the active methylene. Wow! You know a lot 
of organic chemistry. That's a good deal. Okay, that wraps up. Oh, that wraps up all the real stuff in Chapter 22, but there's just one more fun, fun thing. And that is Azo dies. Cool, huh? There they are. Now you've got dyes in everything you do, in your tennis shoes, in your wild clothes, in your markers. What are they? Well, they're these guys. And they're also an opportunity for great review. Because basically, they all have that nitrogen-nitrogen double bond, which is the azo linkage. So the azo linkage allows these compounds to be very highly colored. After all, look at the extended conjugation that these all have. Okay, so a yellow, a yellow, and a red, and they can be very intensely colored. Why am I bringing this up here? Well, how do you suppose these are made? They are made by that other electrophilic center on your diazonium ion. A nucleophile attacks, and what nucleophile would that be? It would be this nucleophile. In other words, electrophilic aromatic substitution. Very cool. So I get the new carbon and nitrogen bond now. And then here's the rest of the ring. And all I have to do is use my base, any base, pick a base, any base, to regenerate the aromatic ring and make my dye. And these guys are on there. You know how to make those. You sulfonate your arom aromatic rings. Those guys are on there because those polar bits allow for um, bonding to the functionality in your clothing, for example, if you're using this as a clothing dye, so for example hydrogen bonding with the multitude of hydrogens, hydroxyl groups, and cellulose. So, azo dyes fit right in with both aryl diazonium ions and with electrophilic aromatic substitution. And it's all because of the UV vis that by extending the conjugation of your system you're going from a boring old white um, organic compound like, say, for example, mm, naphthalene, boring, to cool azo dyes like methyl orange or FD and C yellow, etc., etc. All right, I will just pop these up here. Those are the chapter 22 learning objectives taken right from your textbook. Good stuff to know. Good stuff to help you review and prepare for the final. We will see you in class.